Good day everyone, my name is Katha Abeliesa and I am going to report the first half part of Chapter 6, Institutional Impact of Spanish Rule. 1565, when Spaniards settled permanently in the Philippines and because Filipinos scattered along water roads with about 7,641 islands, um, they used the reduction or restalement under the sound of the bell that imposed their missionaries and incommanders to collect all the scattered Filipinos together. In 1580, the Franciscans proceeded to establish Pueblos, or daring the missionary to reside there, where the church and convent would be constructed, and new Christians converts required to construct their houses around the church also. So the reduction is planning Franciscan Father Juan de Placentia to the Synod of Manila in 1582 and was approved anonymously and the Governor General of the Philippines. So the motive of reduction, the reduction to the Spaniards was no doubt a civilizing device to make the Filipinos law-abiding citizens of the Spanish crown and in the long run to make them ultimately little brown Spaniards and adapting Hispanic culture and civilization. So, katong mga iso nga di yun mafalo sa mga Spaniards, they become remontados, simaronis, ladronis, manteses, malsishores, or tulisanes in the eyes of the Spaniards. So, mga Spanish, they attack those unbaptized or katong mga unbeliever, but their acts are showing something to do inside their religious beliefs, or like it is the way of akay nila. And when maakay na nila, if mabaptize na, they were given Christian names derived from the feast day of the saint when he was born or baptized. What if the Philippines never became under the rule of Spain? So we have external and internal changes. For external changes, it is construction of colonial churches and convents, building of private homes, and Spanish trade which brought in new cultural elements from the Americans and the Pacific alongside with a countless inventory of new ethnobotanic specimens as comote, cassava, aiko, and numerous exotic fruits, vegetables, and medicinal herbs. And for the internal changes, we have integration of Spanish customs and values, Christianity, and Castilian languages such as Enero, Febrero, Uno, Dos, Tres, and etc. So, economic institutions. Taxations without representations. Philippines consist of direct tax, indirect tax, and monopolies. So, indirect tax, it is personal. In indirect tax is um, based on my research now it imposed on one person or group like manufacturers then shifted to a different payer usually the consumer so as a monopolies it is a market structure characterized by a seller selling a unique product in the market no competition so example of this is the meralco because Miralco Electric Company is the only supplier of electricity in the country. So, tax causes monopoly to increase its price and reduce its quantity. That's why gataas or gamahal ang bill because uh, na ay tax. So, um, the bullies or tribute may be paid partially or wholly with cash or kind. In 1570, the tribute was fixed at 8 reales and 1 real is equal to 12 and a half centavos or in kind of gold, blanket, cotton, rice, belts, and raised to 15 reales until the end of Spanish period in the 19th century. During the period, a tribute of 10 reales, this most pre-reales the test for, for 1 real town community chest for one real sanctuary tax for church support for three reals 
So we have special privileges of tax exemptions. We have descendants of the Filipino shiftly class who serve in the pacification campaigns, namely Carlos Lacandola of Manila, Pedro Mujica of Cavite, Andra Tupas of Cebu, laborers of the atelier yard of Cavite, the medicalius or mangkatubong doctor, mga herbal scientists, vaccinators, college and university student of University of Santo Tomas, San Juan de Letran, San Jose, and San Carlos. So, Bandala from the Tagalog word Maridala, so which assumed the meaning of the annual and four sales of requisitioning of goods. Based on my research, Bandala system is like sa pilitang pagbili ng pamalaan and then may quota din sila sa pagproduce ng products. Uh, Papanga provided an annual Bandala of 24,000 Fanegas of rice during Governor Sebastian Hortado D. Corquera's time on 1635 to 1644, causing the Kapampangan refusal to plant rice. Later, the bandala was abolished in the province of Tundo, Bulacan, Pampanga, Laguna, Batangas, Tayapas, and Cavite in November 1782. So, by 1884, the tribute was replaced by the cedula personal equivalent to personal residence tax. Whether Filipino or foreign, over 18 years of age was required to pay the cedula personal. So the cedula, it is the proof of identification and certification that we are paying our tax appropriately. So next is polo e servicio personal or prestacion personal. So it is where encomienda system of forced labor in Spanish colonies to the Philippines intend to conquest or colonization. So, ang edad of 16 to 60 years old were obligated to serve in the community in 40 days. So, they work for structures such as roads, power lines, schools, energy, transportation systems, and many more. So, exempted ka sa service if magbayad ka sa falya or absence ni mo daily at turya Um, during the 40-day period. So, on 1884, the forced labor was reduced to 15 days na lang. Okay, so the negative effects of polo to the Filipinos or the upsetting of the village economy, forced separation from the family, decimation of the male population as they were compelled at times to escape to the mountain. Next is encomiendas, royal and private. Encomienda comes from the word encomendor, meaning to entrust. It is where Spaniards exercise control over a specific place and its habitants. Unfortunately, many Spanish encomenderos committed abuses, such as brutal treatment of the Filipinos, collecting more tribute than that authorized by law, forcing the people to work for them, sure of the people's animals and crops without just compensation. The kinds of encomendas that existed in the Philippines, the royal encomendas, the ecclesiastical encomendas, and the private encomendas. So some people who give any reward for the labor to conquer non-Christian people are the following. Pedro D. Chavez who owned Pandacan, Sampaloc and Macabebe, Juan Esquera who owned Bataan, Francisco Rodriguez who owned Batangas. Two Filipinos from Pampanga were owners of the private encomienda. Francisco Liwag with 55 attributes, Juan de Macapagal with 300 attributes. So next is the Manila Acapulco Galleon trade 1565 to 1815, known as Galleon de Manila or now de China. It runs in the huge stretch 
of the Pacific Ocean for 250 years with two vessels making the journey yearly, one outgoing, the other incoming between Manila and Acapulco, D. Joffres reaching as far as Calao in Peru. So the trip lasted approximately 200 days. So the few Spaniards that relied on the trade got a great deal of money. But when trade declined in the 18th, uh, 18th century, leading to an economic downturn that stopped typical population increase. So Chinese immigrants run by the profitable commerce gathered in the Parian or al Qay, Syria of Binondo, Manila. A mestizo and Christian Chinese group has established in 1687 in Binondo. Chinese mestizos took over the retail and small credit industries. The Manila Acapulco Galleon trade positively impacted the Philippines and the Americans through intercultural exchanges, introducing valuable flora and fauna like avocado, guava, and papaya, and introducing nuat el elements into Philippine languages while borrowing Filipino words. The Manila Acapulco Galleon trade negatively impacted native industries like agriculture and population growth. Filipino involvement was limited to Galleon construction, which conflicted with planting and harvesting schedules. This led to forced labor and initiation of revolts, or rise in rebellion like Samurai and Pampanga. So next is the Royal Economic Society of Friends of the Country. Jose de Vasco y Vargas, a frigate captain for nine years, led the Real Sociedad Econsmica de Amigos del Paz, a society of learned and competent individuals following the royal order in the Philippines. Vasco introduced the plan general Economico promoting self sufficiency through Mexican subsidies. This included monopolies on tobacco, areca nut, spiritus liqueurs, and explosives. Incentives include cash prices and medals for excellence in farming, spices, cotton, and mulberry cultivation. The Royal Economic Society of Friends of the Country credited with introducing the Carabao ban was temporarily suspended due to the Asiatic cholera epidemic. So next is the Royal Philippine Company. Charles III established the Campana Real de Filipinas on March 10, 1785 with a 25-year charter modeled after the Royal Guipuzcoana de Caracas Company in South America. Implications of Royal Philippine Company The Royal Philippine Company faced opposition from Dutch and English traders, as well as Spanish. Manila traders of the Consulado y Comercio de Manila, who saw it as a direct attack on their trade in Asian goods. The Royal Philippine Company facilitated early agricultural growth particularly in Philippine grown products like indigo, sugar, coffee, spices, dye wood, textiles, cotton production, weaving, black pepper cultivation, and silk propagation. So next we have infrastructure, telecommunications, and public utilities development. Quezon Bridge, or formerly Puente Colgante, was the first suspension bridge in the Far East, created by renowned architect Gustave Eiffel of the famous tower in Paris. Carriage tolls amount paid based on the quantity of wheels. Over time, the volume of traffic increased. A tiny corridor in Binondo called Cali Harmiga characterizes the Lazy vehicle movement with a high volume of traffic in Manila. Next is the modern ways of telecommunication developed in the 19th century. Ferrocarril Manila is the sole railroad back then 
in the archipelago and lengthened by 120 kilometers to the Gupan or Pangasinan. Jacobo Zubil de Zangronis and Adolfo Bayo founded Campaya de las Tranvías de Filipinas in Manila in 1885. One tranvia de vapor or steam part between Malabon and Binondo was on 1888 and the first telegram lines between Manila and Corregidor was on 1872. In 1882, the Manila to Hong Kong overseas telegram was laid via Kapi, Bolinao, and Pangasinan, putting Manila telegram in touch with Europe and Asia. And the telephone in Manila began functioning with its main office at Intramuros and a branch at Calle San Jacinto are now deep in Binondo. On 1890. On 1897, the first inter-island submarine cable was linking Manila to Iloilo, Bacolod, and Cebu, laid by the Eastern Extension, Australia, and China Telegraph Company. The Araha driving by one horse, and the Victoria by two, and the Obiquitus, Calesa, and Carietela. Public lightning system in Manila and suburbs using coconut oil, the street of Santa Cruz, Binondo, Quiapo, San Miguel, and San Palo were illumined by the mid-19th century. So this is the reference that I've used in my report. So this is the end of my report and the continuation of this report was assigned to Ms. Kaila Diniz. And thank you for watching.